I'm going to take you back in time into the mid of the 30s of the 20th century. But I want you to understand that I'm not teaching history. I'm teaching a universal effect in the world that unfortunately is still working today. Hatred and, and viciousness have not died. I'm going back to 1933, which was a very remarkable year in which two remarkable men came to power. In 1933 in America, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in his first term. And Franklin Roosevelt saved America and saved the world that had been destroyed practically by the second man who came to power in 1933, which was Adolf Hitler. I came into what was known as the Holocaust Kingdom on January 1943, January uh, 31st, 1943. And we arrived, fortunately, we had been, my transport had been lucky in the sense that they had been sent not in kettle cars, but in passenger, old-fashioned passenger cars. Kettle cars would hold about 80 to 100 people with a bucket or two in the middle, and usually one or two or three corpses when the, the doors would be open because people would be suffocating and going mad. We were fortunate to be in a very old-fashioned pre-World War I passenger cars was third class, was wooden benches, but we were sitting and we had our luggage with us. And we, we realized we were going in a northeastern direction. And when finally the train stopped and you looked out and you were chased out of the, of the uh, train, throw your luggage room, line up in rows of six or five, on one, both sides of the ramps where Light, lighted fences, light, big, big light, big lights on fences, and in between there were like uh, guard towers. And that's all you saw. And we didn't know, of course, that the fences were electrified. So we were told women line up on the right here to the left of the train, the rows of five. I don't to this day can remember where the men lined up. Somehow I have a block about that, I don't know why. But between the train and the fence next to us stood a sort of a field gray colored ambulance with a big red cross on the hood and the big red cross on the, on the door. And of course the red cross, what does it mean to humanity? Security, safety, cover. Uh-huh. That was one of the typical Nazi cynicisms. We will cal calm the sheep down and they will quietly go where we want them to go. Because that ambulance had never, ever carried one sick person or one corpse. The only reason that it was standing there was to carry the tins of Cyclone B gas for the gas chambers to the gas chambers and bring the empty tins back. In front of the uh, ambulance, where about, according to the, how many tram people were in the transport, were about three or four trucks, covered trucks with tarps. And we stood in line, and in the fence to the left of us, a gate was in there, this gate opened, and two SS men came out. One was very elegantly dressed with a medical insignia on the collar. The other one was less elegantly. And they stood on the side and they looked down the rows and they would say, now you walk and you go by truck and you go by truck and you walk and you walk. And pretty soon a pattern evolved out of that. Those under 14 or looking frail enough to be under 14 would be going by truck. And the women over 35 or 40 would be going by truck. And any small children, of course, all they would be lined up at the truck. And they would be put on the truck and when they were on the truck, they would ask the guards, of course, where are we going? Where is our family? Now, what I didn't tell you was when we drove in, when they opened, they opened the door, the first thing that hit you was a stink, a smell that you've never smelled in your life. How would you? Who in his 
right mind in the 20th century had ever smelled 2,000 or 3,000 corpses burning under the chimney that in the back of the truck of the train was rising up and black smoke curling out of it and flames shooting out of the chimney. As a matter of fact, that had been the first crematorium that had been installed in Birkenau at the time. The, the place that we, this was generally known as Auschwitz, was a concentration camp where the extermination camps, where the ex chimneys, where the crematories were, was a place called Birkenau, which was about five miles north of uh, Auschwitz. And that is where we landed. Now, the women that were put in the truck, of course, when the truck would take off, in the direction of, the, of this uh, chimney and, and the flames, and they would ask the guards, where are our, where's our families, where's our brothers, where are our fathers? And the guards would tell them, don't worry about it, you'll see everybody again, you're going to take a nice shower, and then you'll see them again. And when the trains, when the trucks stopped, they would stop in front of a brick building that again, according to the, the testimony of a, of a Nazi doctor, was structured so that it would look Un, unoffensive, secure, like a, like a well-to-do peasant house. The only thing different about it was that the entrance to the, this building was a few steps down, and you went on in, into the building on the bottom, and this, the top, the sort of uh, the roof, was so that you, you could reach it but if you stood up straight. And these women would be put into their into this room, into this building, and where they found themselves was at sort of a probably half the size of this or even less whitewashed room with hooks on the wall, numbers over the hooks, benches underneath, and they were told, "Now get undressed, hang your clothing on the hook, but and remember you to remember the number, and if you have a child." put your, the child right next to you and the numbers right there, remember the number, and be sure you tie your shoelaces together and hang them on the hook. Now the reason for that, of course, was so that the people who collected the remnants after the people were dead wouldn't have to go chasing for shoes. They would have the pairs of shoes hanging on the wall. And sometimes these women would be given a piece of soap before they would be ushered into what seemed like a, I would say, primitive looking shower room. The pipes were on the ceiling, the shower heads were against the pipes, and not until the doors clanged shut and no water came out of the pipes did the people know that something terrible was happening. I'm going to read you a testimony from an assessment for whom I worked for a while who after, when he was uh, and as, a, as a witness in, in, in front of a trial, was very willing to give testimony and he was very precise. And his name was Perry Broad and this is his, his testimony. The disinfectors are at work with an iron rod and a hammer. They open a couple of harmless looking boxes. The directions read Cyclone B, vermin destroyer, poisonous. Uh, as soon as the boxes filled with little blue pellets are opened, they are poured through an opening in the roof, and in each case the cover is carefully in place. Cyclone B works quickly. It, is a, a, it consists of a cyanic acid compound, cyanide. After about two minutes, the shrieks die down and change to a low moaning. Most of the people have lost consciousness. After about two more minutes, assessment Grabner, in charge of the commando, lowers his watch. It is all over. Deadly quiet reigns. The corpses are piled together, their mouths stretched open. It is difficult to move the, the interlaced corpses out of the chamber, as the gas has already stiffened their bodies. Assessment Broad was asked by the prosecutors, 
how many people could be put into the crematoriums in one action. There were crematoriums one, two, three, four, and five. How many could be put into any one room at any one time? Now crematorium one, which was the crematorium in the Auschwitz concentration camp, which had been used, like in all concentration camps, to burn the dead, and, and, uh, and they had a gas chamber, of course, because they had to delouse the closing and the, and the bedding because they were afraid of epidemics. So the gas chamber, the gas chamber in, in the concentration camp was hardly used. The Kremos crematoria in, in number two and three in Birkenau could produce three to four thousand in one operation. Crematorials five, four, and five, only two thousand at a time. If you take these numbers, and during history since, since the Holocaust, they have been, well, deniers have tried to say nothing had happened, and that was the numbers were fantasy. If you take these numbers of, of burn, of capacities of the, of the uh, uh, crematorium, day by day, from 1941, I would say 1942 probably, May or June 1942, until November, I think from November 16 or 17, when the crematoria were blown up. Count the days, count the numbers per day, and you get more than the six million that were that are, are talked about. Now, those of us who have been standing at the left, at the uh, at the gate, at the at the ramp were put into, brought into the camp. At that time it was a, a woman's camp um, to the left and a man's camp to the right. We were brought into a sauna. It was a sauna, like normal sauna, but of course it wasn't used as a sauna because there had been determined in Germany in January 20th, 1942, at a large meeting of the heads of all the of the professions that were involved in the Holocaust. The chair was a man by the name of Heydrich, who was the, actually the, the, I would say the executor of all the, the, uh, the, 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 all the extermination process. And Adolf Eichmann, the name you might have heard, was kept the, the records, was the secretary of, 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 of writing the records. And in this, at this conference in 1942, on January, all the details of the final solution were discussed and finalized. And one of the details that were, of course, finalized was how do we process the prisoners into the camp in order to dehumanize them as fast as possible so they'd be ready for the gas as soon as possible. So, these processes were as follows. When we came into the sauna, we were told to strip down completely. Then we were shaved from top to bottom, supposedly because it was healthy for you, because the, maybe the bugs won't get you, but you're sure the bugs love to make it fresh even more. And then we went into the next room, and the, there was a shower, and one minute ice cold shower, January 31st, 1943. And then we came into a large room, and then there were stations, large tables, where six were handed out. And the first table was the underwear, which was a blue and white striped boxer shorts with a string on top, and a blue and white striped uh, shift, long shift. The next table were uniforms. They were the uniforms of Russian prisoners. It was probably not very much known, but the Russian prisoners of war, since the, the, the Slavic nations were going to be the next uh, uh, project to exterminate, as far as the Germans were concerned, as soon as the Jews were finished, the Russians and the, Slav, the whole Slavic nations were going to be exterminated. So why not save the time to take the Russian prisoners of war into a POW camp and then in the extermination camp, put them directly into the extermination camp. And that is how Russian prisoners of war 
came into Birkenau. And we got their uniforms. There were blood spatters on it, there were bullet holes on it, but there were uniforms, the long pants, a jacket with a little collar here, long sleeves. The only thing that was visible of you were your hands and your face. The next thing, next table were shoes, if you were lucky, and wooden clogs. Shoes were either high top or low top, heavy shoes, because they had told the people, of course they never told the people the truth where they were going. They had told the people when they're going on transport, you're going for labor for the rest of the war, so bring your warmest clothes and bring your heavy shoes. And so the shoes that they didn't use, sent back to Germany to be used, they gave to the prisoners. I happened to be lucky I got a pair of tie shoes. I don't remember whether they were high top or low top, but lucky I was because the clocks, wooden clocks, if you ran in the tempo that we had to run in that camp, never so slow walking, and we had no holes and no socks, and wooden clocks would rub your chin toes, would rub your heels, would rub your instep, and the minute you got a wound in your foot, it was infected within practically hours because there was no hygiene, no health care, health care anywhere, specifically not for Jews. There wasn't a band-aid to be had, there wasn't a, a, a disinfectant to be had. So if you had a wound on your foot, an open wound, within hours it was infected, within days you had gangrene, blood poisoning, and you were ready for the gas. So as I said, I was lucky I got, I got the shoes. The next table was the, the tattoo table. I have on my arm a tattoo which says 34042. The women's tattoos were four di five digits, the men's tattoos were six digits. And I have under my tattoo a little triangle, because how do you define a Jewish looking woman without hair? The thing was that only Jewish protective custody prisoners, so-called protective custody prisoners, which were prisoners that were on, had come by a transport, could be put in the gas. If you had come as a political prisoner with a file, even if you were a Jew, you couldn't be gassed. But if you came as a transport Jew, you could be gassed. And of course, it was very easy to identify men as Jews because men were circum Jewish men were circumcised. Jewish women, bald, blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, how do you identify them? So they put the little triangle under the Jewish women's numbers to be sure that they only would gas Jewish women from transports. After we got that, we got a kerchief which had to be tied a certain way, and then we got what to me was the most dehumanizing item, a bowl about that big, about that deep, which was sort of a reddish enamel uh, was covered, and that bowl was the awful of the civilized utensils that you had. You had no spoon, no knife, no fork, no comb, no brush, no handkerchief, no towel. You had nothing. You were at the level of an animal. You had the bowl to drink out of, the bowl to eat out of, and the bowl to you to eliminate into. And that was it. And with this, with this bowl in hand, we were brought into the camp, in, into block three the so-called new arrival block. If any of you have seen pictures of the stone blocks of Birkenau, these stone blocks were reserved for the Jewish prisoners. And they had, they had bunks in them. I would say the block would be about from here to there. And they had bunks, one, two, three, four rows of bunks, two stories high, there was nothing on the ground. The bunks were bored, nothing else. There was no straw sack, no nothing. And when we came in, and we, we came in, and the, uh, the, the block workers at the time 
in Birkenau were all Slovakian girls who had survived one year already, Slovakian Jewish girls who had survived one year already, the selections and whatever, and diseases, and those that had left over had gotten, of course, all the jobs in this new camp, because Birkenau had just been established in, I would say, September of 1942. And so by 43, they weren't very old. My number is 34042. By the time I came into camp in January of 1943, there were probably, if a lot, five or six thousand women in the camp. The numbers were tattooed running on, which meant any number between what was there now and my number 34042 was in the gas, or had died a normal death, which if they were lucky. So now we had that number and we came in and there were these, these uh, block workers, they were the Slovakian block workers. Actually their numbers were four digit numbers because they were the very first ones that had been tattooed. And so when we came in they said, go up on the second bunk. And we said, we're tired. We were, We've been standing all day, we've gone through that whole thing, the whole night in the train. They said, listen to me, us, go in the top bunk. And there were only two right, because that was our first lesson in survival. Because in Birkenau, you had to make up your mind very quickly. Did you want to live or did you want to die? Dying was as easy as can be. You didn't have to work very hard. There was one block, one stone block block 27, and behind it was block 25. Block 27 was the only Jewish so-called hospital block. Block 25 was the death block where they collected the daily fare to the crematorium. If you had, did not want to live, you could have signed, signed into block 27. The Nazi doctor would go through three, four times a day. He'd look at the people in the bunk, he has the list, and if he sees the number that looked to him right for the gas, made a check mark, and then he handed that list to the block leader, and she would call out these numbers, take him to block 25, and at night the trucks would drive up and take the daily ration up to the crematorium, and they wouldn't go quiet. They'd scream, and they'd pray, and they'd cry, and they'd curse, because everybody knew what was waiting them. I mean, when we had arrived there, the first thing we had asked, where, where are we, what is this? And they said, you want to know? See that, that, that uh, chimney out there? That's where your family just took a trip up the sky. So what were you going to do? That was it. The thing that you, if you wanted to live, you had to learn all the lessons that were to be learned. One of the lessons, of course, I'll tell you in a minute, was just being on the top bunk. But the main lesson you had to learn was to try to find a job inside the camp so you didn't have to go through the daily selections for the gas. And that happened, I'll tell you right now, this happened after when we went up in the, in the bunks, in the top bunks. At night, if you had to go to the bathroom, there were three three uh, blocks in a row. Block one, two, and three. Next to block one, close to the fence, was a latrine. And at night, of course, you weren't allowed to go to the latrine. So right in front of the block, they had put out two or three buckets, and one of the workers there was the night guard, and, guard, and she was the one in charge of taking these buckets to the latrine when they were full. Well, of course, when you came out there, you needed to go to the, to the, the, the bathroom and the buckets were full. And she didn't feel like having to take them to right now to, 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 to the latrine. She'd get a, she had a nice stout stick, get one over your hind end, and she'd tell, she say, get lost. So what do you do? You get back on your bunk, what do you do? You use your bowl. What do you do with what's in the bowl? These bunks were set into small stone walls and between the boards and the stone walls there was a small slit. You poured it down. Who got it on the head? 
The ones in the, in the bucket, in the, in the bunk below. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, the next morning when they brought the big sort of kettles with what they called, sometimes called, they called it tea and sometimes they called it coffee, it was black. The next lesson given by the, by the uh, block workers, because see, we could speak to the block workers, we spoke Czech and they spoke Slovak, which is very similar. This is the one lesson that one can learn very quickly was that knowing the language of the persecutors and of the rulers would save your life. So we spoke Czech and we could speak to the to all the people that, that were working there. And so the next morning when that, these kettles came in, they said, now, get yourself a bowl, wash your bowl out if you've used it, rinse it out, then drink as much as you can, and then make sure that you wash your hands and face. Because if you go, you're going to be in the selection this morning, and if they, 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 there's a selection, they see a dirty face or dirty hand, that's a reason for them to put you in the gas, because after all, if you haven't got the, enough incentive anymore to wash your hands and face, you're ready for the gas. So that was another advice we got. Then we would stand outside in roll call, rain, shine, it could take hours because of course we lined up in rows of five and invariably somebody fell over dead in the roll call and then you had to start all over again. But when finally the roll call was over, sometimes it took two and three hours, the so-called capos from the, from the uh, outside working commandos, which I call the death commandos, those were the commandos where they dug ditches, uh, tore up fields, rooted out trees, uh, dug up, uh, uh, what do you call it, rubble from, from bombardment, from bombing, anything that you could do with a pick and a shovel and no food, and outside for eight hours. And before you got outside, the, the, the commando said to march out through another selection. And again, the doctor and the other SS men would stand there. And this time they didn't say you walk and you go by tuck. They had a walking stick. And they'd stop one of the uh, rows of five because they, the, oh, the uh, women's orchestra was playing these wonderful marches and we marched in step. But when, when they, they stopped one, the whole thing stopped, they will look down there and they see somebody maybe with a dirty face or maybe who looked like a skeleton, which was the advanced stage. It was like a, a, a skull with a large nose and big eyes and nothing else. So they were ready for the gas. Or if they, if they sh sh uh, shuffled their feet or if they didn't march. Them. I mean, most anything served them to, to pull you out, and they pull this group out, they would be sitting at the side of the road, the rest of the, 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 the commander would march out, they would out eight, eight hours, at night another, another marching in, another selection, the ones pulled out from that selection, together, were taken together with the ones that were there already to block 25, and as I said before, from block 25, it was a short step by truck to the crematorium. And you had to find out as fast as possible if you wanted to live. First of all, eat anything that looked edible, whether it was a crumb that was thrown out by somebody, one of the Polish prisoners who would get packages, or whether it was some, whether it was weeds that looked edible. Believe me, there are some very good edible weeds. Or if you were lucky and you would find the butt of a cigarette and you would collect some tobacco because tobacco, I mean a cigarette would assuage your, assuage your hunger. I mean it kills hunger. So if you could get a cigarette that was of course a good day. And that was the first thing was eat anything you could find to eat. Secondly, get out of the way of anything that looks like a uniform or, or a, a what they call functioning, function heftling, a function a prison that had a, had a function, that was, had, a, had a job. Get out of the way of everybody. You always try to avoid anybody that might have a stick in hand or might have a gun in hand. 
And the next one, and the most important thing was to find out if you could find somebody inside the camp that worked inside the camp, if it was somebody who lived next door to you or lived in the same street as you or might be a rough, distant relative, anybody that you could find that could, would, might know you, because the, this was the unwritten law in the camp, if you managed to, uh, to contact somebody that you think you knew and give them your name and, you, and tell them that you're on the outside commando, it was the obligation of the person on the inside to find a job for you and get you in, in the, um, to work in the inside of the camp. Because it, on the, those on the outside, as I said, I call them the death commandos because you lived the expected time, two and a half months, maybe maximum three months. I was extremely lucky through absolute fluke that I got a job on the inside. I, had, it, I was in block three, and in block three, the uh, block leader was a Slovak woman by the name of Ilka Grün, and Ilka spoke minimal German, I mean, yeah, minimum German, but no French, and of course he spoke Slovak. And in the block, with me in the block, where several transport of German and French women. And so Ilka from time to time, since I spoke French and German and Slovak and Czech, she used me as an interpreter. And ever so often in order to pay me for it, she would give me a cup of coffee in her little, her little block room was a haven of warm and neat and quiet because there was nothing you couldn't get in the camp if you once you had connection. That was the thing, you had to have connection. So ever so often she'd invite me into a little block room and she'd have cigarettes and she had coffee and she'd let me have some. And one day a friend of hers, a so-called runner, because the runners were the telephone of Birkenau. Birkenau itself had no telephones that came. And there were a group of women, they were called the runners. They had, were again, privileged, they had their own block and they carried messages throughout the camps. And one of these runners came into Ilka's uh, block room and we introduced me, and it turned out she had lived in Prague. And believe it or not, Prague was a fairly big city, but we had a common friend, a journalist by the name of Jimmy. And of course, having somebody in common like that meant she had to immediately help me. And I was out of there within two days. And I went, went again to the sauna, I got uh, fresh clothes, I got the camp clothing, I got, I mean, the dresses, the striped dress, and I got an apron, and I got a new kerchief, and I got new, no, I kept my shoes, because those I had kept before. And I was set behind a large uh, desk to, to write in the only things that were registered when you came, when you survived, I mean, when you, when you did not go directly into the gas and came into the camp, the only thing that was noted down was your number, your name, your age, your profession. And that was in the so-called big book. And that's what I entered for a while. But I have what is known probably as the worst handwriting in the world, and I always had it. And the head of the highest Jewish uh, prisoner, a, name, a woman by the name of Katja Zinger, who was the head of the administrative office, was very proud of her book that was very well kept. And when she saw my handwriting, I think she flipped. And she decided that this one's got to go. And But again, there in, in an unwritten law in the women's camp, I don't know if that worked in the men's camp, but in the women's camp, if you lost a job, you could be demoted to a lower job, you could be promoted to a higher job, you could be I say horizontally promoted on the same level, but you could not be put back on the outside commando. That meant you stayed inside. So when Katya got rid of me, I guess she felt kind of guilty for, because for, for just throwing me out because of the handwriting. 
So she promoted me to the so-called construction department. In the construction department, I typed. I typed specifications for camps from, I would say, the Polish-German border to the Ural Mountains, because the Germans were determined to either sterilize, exterminate, or intern the entire population of Europe, except for the, Slav for the Scandinavian countries, which I suppose were Aryan enough, and, and England. So these things were all done in preparation in the construction department. And while I was in the construction department, I got sick, I got an infection, I don't remember what it was. And uh, there again, the rule of, a, of time in the camp played a large part, because it seemed, the num as I said, the numbers were put on running from the minute that the camp had opened. And by, by about uh, 1940, I would say 1944, February or so, when I had to go to the hospital with my with the infection, my number 34042 was a low number because the numbers had gone up to A1000, and I don't know what they were on, but anyway, my number was a low number. And low numbers, to this day, nobody knows why low numbers had privileges. And I, sometimes I wondered whether it was sort of that they begrudgingly had to admit somebody's managed to survive their murderous regime. But anyway, being a low number, when I came into the hospital, I was given my own bed, which meant the other beds in the hospital blocks. By that time, the Jewish prisoners had been allowed into the about six hospital blocks on the Aryan side, which were the lab and, and, and operation room and doctor's offices. And so there were uh, dorm large dormitories, and usually in the beds they were going to have two, two people in one bed. But being a privileged prisoner, I had my own bed, and I didn't have to stand roll call. And my friends from the, 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 the men friends from the uh, construction department brought me the medications I needed, and I was out of there within uh, practically a week or so. But that was only because my number was low. The lower, the, for instance, the four-digit numbers of the Slovakian girls, these Slovakian girls with four-digit numbers, were so quasi the aristocracy of the camp. And so when I came, now when I came out of the hospital, of course, I had to have lost my job, of course, and I had to stand up in line again and be assigned for, by the labor leader, to, by the SS labor leader to go into the workplace. And when I came up in front, he looked at me, he said, ah, the office help. He remembered me, I guess, from when I worked in the administration office. He said, you've been here long enough, you go to Canada. Now, Canada was the I would say the elite commando of the camp, and only for one reason, because in Canada all the clothing that was brought in by the transports, the clothing that was sent in from, from uh, robbed stores or whatever, was sorted in Canada, bundled by item, and sent to Germany. And of course anybody in Canada, we stole like the ravens. We stole and we smuggled stuff in for our uh, fellow prisoners, underwear and panties. And strangely enough, women didn't, were not allowed to wear bras in the camp. I don't know to this day what the reason was for that. But anyway, bras were one of the most uh, in-demand in objects that we could bring into. So we brought, we smuggled merrily. And somehow by that time, the SS really, it was middle, middle 44, things weren't going so good, and some of the SS did not check very often if, because they knew that we were smuggled in. But the day came when they decided enough smuggling, the Canada commando is going to be put into a separate camp. And so we were put into a separate little camp right behind crematorium five, where we had practically our own shower room, our own shower, and practically, I guess, the same showers that the transport went through if they came, if they were put into the camp. Anyhow, 
we were in a, in a little place in Canada. And by that time, towards the end of the year, things were getting kind of renewed, things were getting bad. The, I was probably one of the very few people that knew when the invasion happened, when June 6, 1945 happened, because I was on my way to the dentist office, but another advantage of being a privileged prisoner, I could go to a dentist. I mean, the only thing he ever did was pull out teeth, but anyway, I needed the tooth to be pulled, and I was on my way to the dentist office, and the camp was practically empty, there were very few people, it was during the work day, and all of a sudden the siren sounded, and it was so-called uh, lockdown. And I raced myself to the, to the uh, dentist office, and I had a friend there, and I said, what's going on? And she said, the dentist, I guess when, he, when the Germans worked with prisoners for any length of time, they became acquainted. I mean, they were normal people for them. Otherwise, we were pieces to, to be disposed of. But if you had an individual relationship, so her, the dentist, her boss there, had told her that there's been an invasion at, at, in Normandy. But somehow or other, that was kept totally quiet. Nobody else knew. But so by that time, when, as, as the year went on, in about November or so, November, December, rumors were that transports were going into Germany and then that we had several air raids. Unfortunately, the only American air raid, there was only one American air raid, the other air raids were from the Russians and, and I think some, some uh, British air raids because the Americans claimed that they couldn't, they couldn't uh, let their, their bombers, uh, uh, how should I say, conduct bombing raids that far into the country. So they, they didn't bomb very much. But there were several, uh, several air raids by other, other, other uh, allies. And in January, came January of 1945, they had, in the meantime, blown up all the crematoria, and we had seen a lot of trains going into Germany with files, with papers. They were trying to eliminate all traces, if they possibly could. And, then, but I'm telling you now, I always insert, because it is important that we know that not everything was black and white that there were some gray areas. There were some people, some Germans that had tried to help, and there were some Jews that were miserable. So, they'd been, and were, were aggressive and were mean. So, one day, and it was, must have been January 17th of 1945, the head of our commando, a man by the name of Werner Hahn, came in, there were two blocks of women, and three blocks of men in the, worked in the, in, Canada, in the Canada compound. And he went through all the compound, all the blocks, and he said, listen people, go into the warehouses. There were about 20 warehouses where we were sorting clothes, baby clothes, women's clothes, furs, shoes, suits, uh, anything but was sorted out and sent into Germany, of course. He said, go in there, the thing's going to be blown up here anyway, get the warmest clothes you can find, the best shoes, make yourself a backpack of separate clothing and food and whatever you have, we're going on a long march. And we did. In, on January 18th, 1945, 58,000 people from Auschwitz I, which was the concentration camp, Auschwitz II, which was Birkenau, the extermination camp, in Auschwitz III, the factory camp, which they had established with slave labor workers. 58,000 people were put on the road, not on the road, on a, in forest walks, and it was the heaviest winter they had in a long time, the, the snow, snow practically knee high. And we went out in the snow. For two and a, for two and a half days, I think we walked and we finally came to a little railroad station where long trains, freight trains, and open coal cars were standing waiting for us because the Germans, they knew they had lost the war, but they weren't going to lose the final solution. 
they were going to finalize, every Jew was going to be exterminated if, if it cost them their, their war. And it had cost them the war. But they put us, they put us into those trains. They put us through Berlin to, to, Berlin, through Berlin to a camp, Ravensbrück, where we stayed until, January, until April 45. In April 45, they deported us again. And this time they didn't shoot or they didn't kill or they didn't beat because they had asked for exchange. They wanted, the Germans wanted their prisoners back and they had offered the Allies the, their prisoners of war. And the Allies said, we don't want those prisoners of war, they're well off. We want the women of the concentration camps. Ravensbrück was the first one. So Ravensbrück was given packages and was, they, they took, took out the prisoners by nationalities that the Swedish Red Cross buses came in and took out prisoners by nationalities. Unfortunately, my group, and groups always stuck together, my group was all Slovak except for myself and a Greek girl. And not, and I could have gone with the Germans and I could have gone with the Austrians and I could have gone with the Czechs, but I wanted to stick to my group. And the Slovaks never got a turn. We were put on the road again and marched again. So we marched, but this time, as I say, without beating. And we finally came through artillery fire, through crossfire. We really did a, a wild escape and came to a, on a country road to a checkpoint, to a GI, to a checkpoint of two GIs, one former prisoner that was sitting on the, on the Jeep with them. And we had, uh, our group of 15 girls, we had stuck together, came up to them and I, since I was the only one who spoke English, I walked up to them and I said, where are we supposed to go? He looked at me, speak English, he said, I said, of course I do, why not? He said, well, I don't know what to do with you, you go, go, go where you came from. And so without a word, we all rolled up our sleeves and showed our tattoo and the prisoner that was sitting on there said, they can't go where they came from. They came from an extermination camp. And I'll never forget the guy, the GI, looking at us and looking at him and saying, what the hell is an extermination camp? And I had to think to myself, this young man who probably had served in the army, either maybe from 41 on or from 43 on, to liberate the oppressed people of Europe had no idea who the most oppressed people were. So he said, well, I don't know what to do with you. There's a village, in the, our CEO is in the village. You go ahead there. And we walked out there. And all of a sudden I stopped. And I looked around. And I said, I could walk, I could stand, I could sit, I could twirl around. I was free. And within practically the two years to the date, and no three years from 1942 when it was deported from Prague, to the day, it was the first day, that May day, that I was without a guard. And that was my day of liberation. I probably could go out for another hour or so, but you have to leave. So I want to leave you with one thought, please. You are my legacy. The people are trying to deny the existence of a Holocaust. And I've got to teach as many people like you who will remember what I told you, and you will not, not, not forget what I told you. Because one of these days, all of you, if you go to college, have professions, might have very important profession for a multi-corporation or a government with, Ill, with evil intention. And if they ask you, in your profession, by executing your profession, to, that you have to kill one human being, please remember it, and please remain human. Thank you. <laughs>